So, with great pleasure, I would like to introduce <laughs> Professor Stephen Hicks. All right. An old, uh, actually ancient Arab proverb says, may you live in interesting times. All right, All right so we're very fortunate. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And the reason for that, of course, is that we are big-brained human beings, and if we keep our brains turned on and are active-minded, we thrive on information. We're curious. We want to know everything that's going on. And so we keep abreast of journalism and the economic debates and the political discussions and what's going on in the schools, particularly in higher education. And we want to know it all and we want to get it right. And so we live in interesting times indeed and perhaps even distressing times uh, when we monitor what's going on in the press. Of course, of course we, we all think, think at least half of the politicians are <laughs> depraved, if not worse, and we worry about the quality of the journalism that we are receiving and what's being fed to our children. So we're in uh, the modern world, and the modern world has an enormous uh, number amount of good news, right? and we're all the beneficiaries of that good news, but at the same time, polarization and enormous amount of extraordinarily negative news. So about today, we have a full slate, and uh, <clears throat> I have lots of things to say, but I don't want to just be talking to you for the full day. So what I would like you to do is uh, make sure you have something to write on and a writing implement. And I know uh, Sam and the team have some booklets and pens available if you don't have one of your own available. Because uh, at various points I want you to uh, I'm going to put questions out there. I know there will be things on your mind. I'd like you to write things down. Now, what I want to do, though, in the uh, first session, I don't know how much of the session I will take, but I want to lay out some big picture framing things. We hear a lot about modernity, postmodernity, and political correctness, and identity politics, and meta-narratives and all of this language and so on. What's going on in the intellectual world and how is that spilling out into the popular culture? I so want to have a frame, but all of this is complex. And so out of that, what I will then do by the time we get most of the way through this first session is then say, well, there's this issue and there's this issue and there's this issue. So we have a multi-dimensional discussion and debate that's going on. And then the subsequent sessions will drill down into this particular set of issues, take a break, drill down into another set of issues, and, and so on. So first question <clears throat> from me to you. And if you could write this down, I'll give you a minute to think about it. And that is, uh, why are you here? And if you can distill all of that into what's the most important, interesting, or significant question on your mind today. So many intellectuals will say that we live in a postmodern world. I think it is definitely fair to say that significant subcultures within society are postmodern, and they set themselves up as adversaries or as wanting to move beyond the modern world. So if we're going to start by trying to make sense of post-modernity, the uh, first prior question would be, well, what is modernity? What do we mean by the modern world? So I want to start with this chart <clears throat> while the uh, clicker is hopefully coming. And we can get the guys. So what we have on our chart is uh, an economic indicator about the modern world. Along the horizontal axis. This is gross domestic product, world GDP, how productive we have been, how uh, good we have been at making stuff. And there's uh, another side to this transaction because we only make stuff that's useful, so there's got to be a transaction. Someone has to make a judgment call that what's been made is useful to them and so willing to use it or purchase it, right, and so forth. And then uh, on the vertical axis, we have 
uh, a normalized American dollars for 2015, the whole world producing $20 trillion, $40 trillion, and so on. Now, this is 2,000 years. So we're about here. So go back 500 years. What's going on 500 years ago? Well, Columbus has crossed the Atlantic Ocean. Protestant Reformation is about to uh, break out. So we're getting into uh, some interesting times there. Year 1,000. <clears throat> was going on a thousand years ago. Well, the dark ages are going to end. This chunk of time had been pretty grim, declining literacy rates, declining life expectancy, and so forth. But things start to pick up around year 1000. Interestingly, uh, why that happened, in large part because for 500 years, there had been an expectation that the world was going to end. Judgment Day was imminent. And uh, I don't know if you're old enough, I guess most of you are, to remember what things were like at the change to 2000 from 1999 and all of the fears about not necessarily a religious apocalypse, but some sort of technological apocalypse, Y2K. And even as rational and scientific and modern as we were, there was a great deal of fervor. All of that was building up as the 900s, 980, 990, 997, 998. It's going to happen for numerological reasons, 1,000. It didn't happen. And so, hmm, right? Many people are saying, well, maybe we'll just postpone the apocalypse, get down to business. And it's very interesting. Within a generation, you start to see things picking up uh, around year 1,000. 500, right? Uh, Rome is in a serious decline phase. We go back to year one. Rome is transitioning from. Uh, being a republic to being an imperial state, lifetime of Jesus. So span of 2,000 years of history, that is a lot. But what's interesting about it on this economic indicator is just that that's basically a flat line of human productivity. If we were to scale it up, we would find you know things were a little bit higher, and then they start to decline down here, and they go up. But at this scale, it's almost insignificant. That's 2,000 years. If you were to take another 2,000 years and extend this chart right over to here, negative 2,000 years, great. But I need to plug this into something. Yeah, which is up there. Yeah. OK. And I don't know if this Bluetooth will reach that far, but we can sure try. Thanks, man. So if we were to go back there, minus 2,000 years, right? flat line. Minus 4,000 years, still flat line. I'm trying to keep my scale precarious, right? Minus 6,000 years, back to that corner, flat line. You go all the way around to about minus 15,000 years, flat line. Agricultural revolution, right? You remember from your middle school years, right? right? The uh, Tigris and Euphrates River and some things start to happen there. Before that, even lower. So unimaginably long stretches of human living, low economic productivity, and then something happens. Right? Right. And this is right in around the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, on into the year 2000. That's spectacular. And perhaps the most interesting and important intellectual question is, why did that happen? Why didn't it happen in 1400 or minus 600? And then when we start to drill down, if I can, hopeful, uh, not so look at that. It's getting too eager. Oh, good. I was thinking about it. Maybe if I lean far over, there we go. Nice, good. So this is the uh, same timeline, but it's broken down a little bit further by regions. So you can see different countries over here, the United States at the top, Austria, right, and so on. But notice where the countries start to take off. And so this purplish country is the one that is ahead of the pack, and it starts to rise before everyone else in that purple country is the United Kingdom, which makes perfectly good sense, the home of the Industrial Revolution. And so, of course, when we learn, we say the Industrial Revolution is a big deal. But then, of course, there's a follow-up question. Why did the Industrial Revolution happen first in England? Right? Why didn't it happen in Botswana? 
right, or subcontinent Asia. Right? And then you start to say, well, what had happened earlier in England had been a glorious revolution, limiting the power of the king, parliament becomes ascendant. So there is a liberal democratic revolution that had happened earlier. There was an agricultural revolution. Isaac Newton and the scientific revolution had started to mature, and he is English. John Locke, the great philosopher, is developing an entire liberal political philosophy. An important component of that is religious toleration and getting the state out of politics and urging people as a matter of civic morality to be willing to tolerate other people thinking for themselves and making their own decisions on religious matters. And all of that happens in two, three, four generations before the Industrial Revolution. So we see in England the development of a very liberal, much more rational, open culture, and then Within that space, of course, you start to have scientific experimenting, but that translates into engineering uh, 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 inventiveness, and England then starts to take off. So the United States is one of the America, uh, sorry, the British offshoots, right? Uh, comes along a little bit later. Uh, but you'll notice up here that it's all Western European nations, and then the various other nations come along a little bit later. So success right, all around the world. I wanted to look at this one. <clears throat> That's an economic indicator, but the other things that matter, uh, life expectancy. What do we do with the increasing amount of wealth? Well, we eat better food. And so what we find then, this is the, uh, the orange line here, energy capture. Right? How much calories do you have right, per day? And at exactly the same time, that starts to skyrocket. That translates uh, into life expectancy issues. You eat better, you live longer. As we start to develop modern medicine, people start to not die of things that they used to die from, uh, and so forth. So all sorts of things start to happen. Uh, this just will make a point about politics. If I can get this to the point here. Yeah, there, the number of people living in democracy. In this context, that's just a short form from some sort of liberal, democratic, republican, open society, and so forth. That starts to skyrocket at the same time. So, modern world, revolutionary in a historical context. You know, we like to talk about whether things are evolving or whether they're revolutions, and then the historians will say, well, it's not a revolution unless it happens in sooner than 300 years or 150 years or whatever. But this is an astonishing amount of changes in many cultural dimensions, religion, science, politics, economics, and so forth. And it's all happening in the same parts of the world at around the same time, and the world is not the same as it has been. Now, in philosophical formulation, <clears throat> right, that's all of the social science calculations. Why did that happen? And we start to tell some stories. We say industrial revolution, political revolutions, and so forth. So we have uh, here engineering, the industrial revolution that's typically dated from 1750. 1769 is a significant date for James Watt's steam engine. There have actually been lots of other engines that have been generated. This is the first one that's economically viable. That is to say, the economic value of the inputs relative to the economic value of the outputs of this machine. The, uh, the costs are lower than the outputs. Then you can start using it for economic purposes, and that changes the world. But notice we have dates in the early part of the, or the middle part, rather, of the 1700s. That is uh, two generations after the first major scientific revolution. So you go back to the late 1600s, and you find amazing things happening in mathematics, the early development of calculus and statistics, and then the first great physical system of the world developed by Isaac Newton in 1660s, 1680s. Coincidence of that, you can apply science, of course, to inanimate objects, and we get various kinds of engineering. But what if you take the scientific mindset that's being developed and start to apply it to human beings, right, who are even more complex and so forth? And what we say is we're going to do it medicine, scientifically. Well, over the course of the next generation, or sort of the next century, right, you find 
the elimination of all the superstitions and witchcrafts and old wives' tale. Apologies to old wives, right? But uh, you know what I mean, right? We're going to do this empirically, experimentally to find out what actually works. So we have uh, the development of chemistry, the first modern periodic table developed by French economist Lavoisier, who was later to lose his head in the French Revolution. But in England, Edward Jenner, the founder of the science of vaccination and immunology, right? So obviously on our minds, right, once again. Uh, but behind all of that, there was a philosophical revolution. When you take your courses in the history of philosophy, they will say the father of modern philosophy is, and then there's a little bit of controversy here. Most textbooks will say it's Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am, the methodological doubt. Uh, but we have a new way of thinking. In England, Francis Bacon, the development of <clears throat> inductive methods, the empirical methods, the underpinnings of what comes to be scientific method, then more maturely in John Locke. Now what makes all of these guys modern? They disagree with each other and so we have internal debates in philosophy, but all of them over the course of the early part of the 1600s are arguing against entrenched authority that had said if you want to know the truth, if you want to know the way the world works, what you need to do is appeal to either scripture. There is a book in which all of the important truths have been written down. You read that book and you believe that book. So it's a matter of belief in authoritative words as written down by some individuals. Now then, of course, there's a controversy. Why is that book so special? And then the claim will be that it, it was delivered to certain prophets, special individuals, 2,500, 2,800 years ago, whom God spoke to directly, and they wrote that down. And so the authority of this is not your own awareness uh, sensorily of the facts or your own ability to process the arguments rationally, but trust or faith in what was said to be delivered to some individuals many years ago. And that's a huge act of faith that one needs to engage in. So faith is the source of all important truths. Now, this book, of course, is very important. Can we just let anybody read the book for themselves and figure out what it means? The other wing wants to then say the book is very important, but the book needs to be translated by and interpreted by people who are specially authorized to translate and uh, interpret the book. And so you shouldn't try to figure it out for yourself. Rather, you should appeal to an institution that has specially trained interpreters of the book, and you should take on faith what they say the book means. So what we then have is a long tradition in the West that had said, knowledge of all of the most important things is a matter of faith. Either faith that those prophets out in the desert and in the mountains 2,800 years ago got it right directly from God, and or what they received has been properly interpreted over the course of many centuries by authorized individuals. These guys are mounting then an epistemological revolution saying no, faith and mystical insights are not the source of legitimate knowledge. Reason is the source of legitimate knowledge. Every individual has their own mind, they have senses, they, they can look at the world, they can interpret it, they can come up with competing all, all of their interpretations and argue about it, and it's only if you go through that process that we can get actual genuine knowledge. So that epistemological or cognitive revolution fought over the course of a few generations is decisive to the extent that it won and it did win out in the 1600s, we then say we're now into modern philosophy. And it's then not an accident in the 1600s that we then get the development of modern science also starting to happen in the mid to late 1600s because science can't happen right, with its important attention to observation, interpretation, argumentation, and so forth, unless you say reason matters a lot, and that's how we are going to do it. But reason also has another implication, and it plays out, because uh, who has reason? 
And one of the striking claims about the moderns was the claim that everybody has the power of reason. It's not that some special individuals have the power of reason and the rest of us need to trust what they do. So everybody has the power of reason. And that then means if we really want people to come to know what's important, then it's important to encourage every individual to think for themselves. So in the 1600s, you see this being urged. Think about religious matters. And so then religious toleration becomes very important because you have to tolerate people working through their own individual processes. Political democracy and republicanism start to become important again because if we think everybody has the capacity for reason, then everybody has the capacity to think about important political matters. And since those political matters affect their life, they should have a say in it and to be able to participate in the process rather than being dictated to by the special people who have all of the knowledge. So we start to see the development of individualism on religious matters. We start to see a reassertion of political liberty. It has economic implications. If you think that people are smart, they're grounded, they can assess the facts, then you think they can be responsible for their own economic lives. They don't need to be looked after, after or directed by superior intelligences. So you're more likely to say then, Let's leave people able to make their own decisions about what their careers are going to be going into, what they're going to make, whom they're going to deal with, negotiating over prices. And of course, business negotiations are little arguments to come up with the best result for all of the parties. And so we start to see early capitalism. So we see the liberal revolutions in the late 1600s and on into the 1700s, early capitalism developing in the 1700s. I've got Adam Smith there, the first modern economics textbook published in 1776. And you'll notice that the dates really are all in a, in a line here. The 1700s is consequent to here. And the promise of the modern world, the early modern world, is as the intellectuals started to realize all of these revolutions that are going on and putting them together into a package, this is my way of putting it together into a package, they say, we have an integrated way of looking at the world. This is a brand new revolutionary philosophy that the modern world is going to be about reason and science and engineering and modern medicine and individualism and tolerance and democracy and so forth. All of the things that we by and large have taken for granted on the 20th century and on into the 21st century were revolutionary over the course of a century and a half. Now by the time we get to this date, this is largely promissory in the 1700s. What we think this is going to do is lead to people not only being freer, but people being wealthier, having more stuff available, and healthier. And another astonishing thing about the 1700s, we were becoming enlightened, and we think that we can make progress on every social dimension. And that is something else that had never happened before in human history. The idea that human beings can make the world a better place. And that our children should live better lives than we live, and our grandchildren will live better lives than our children. It's astonishing when you read back in the history how it was dominated by the ideas that either there was a great time in the past and the entire history of humanity is a story of decline. It's a fall. Men and women used to be giants and now we are a puny remnant. And so stories of decline and decay and decadence. Or stories that say history is cyclical. Yeah, we maybe get a little better for a little while, but then things go down, then they go up, and then they go down, they go down. It's just the same damn thing over and over again. But there's no net progress across history. You don't, until the 1700s, see in the Enlightenment era a sense that progress is possible and that progress is now the natural birthright of human beings, that optimistic fusion. We can, with the application of reason and goodwill and leaving creative, free individuals lots of social space to try out their ideas and try their experiments, we can fix every problem that has beset human beings. The pursuit of happiness, right, that language in the Declaration of Independence, right, as the natural birthright of human beings, right, not just suffering and sacrifice and putting up with stuff right, and hoping that the fates don't treat you too badly, right, that said that I should be able to put together a successful life and enjoy it. That's the Enlightenment. 
Now this is the modern world, and this is a philosophical framing right, of the modern world. And the claim is that uh, you know, in the 1600s and the 1700s, the intellectuals and the activists were making a promise. We will make the world a better place, and so I've got the dotted lines here. Uh, and now, two centuries later, two and a half centuries later, we have the data. How has it gone? And that's what this stuff is all about. Now, post-modernism, <clears throat> then, what do we mean by postmodernism. Well, the suggestion that's built into the name then is to say we're taking the entire modern world and we're saying that in some sense that's ended and we're going to need to go into something else, something that's posterior to it. Or that the, post mod sorry, the modern world has been some sort of a failure and what we need to do is have a different kind of philosophical and institutional framing for the way the world is going to go. So, Here's Michel Foucault, perhaps the most famous of all of the post-modernists. And here he's offering a geological metaphor. And we'll unpack this a little bit. The deepest strata of Western culture have been exposed and are once more stirring under our feet. All right, so that's metaphorical. So deepest strata, so rock. So you get all the way down to the bedrock. So he's making a very strong intellectual claim. What is the bedrock? What are the deepest strata upon which Western civilization is built? So there's the foundation there, and we've gone on to build various things. Now we're getting down to the foundations, and this is a bit of an earthquake metaphor. We are shaking the foundations. Right? We're exposing those foundations, and we're going to uh, uh, stir them right under our feet. So we're in earthquake times. <clears throat> John Gray, a British right, postmodernist. Gray has actually gone through several intellectual phases. As he gets older, he's becoming increasingly pessimistic, increasingly postmodern. But notice the claim that we are making here. We, this is now in the early part of the 21st century, live today amid the dim ruins of the Enlightenment project. So there was an Enlightenment project. We know what that is. That has led to ruins. And not only that, dim ruins. The lights are going out. Right? They're being dimmed. Which was the ruling project of the modern period. Jean-Francois Lyotard, a Frenchman. A longer quotation here, but I got this one in part because Lyotard is the one who gave us the label postmodern. The postmodern condition, we'll have some quotes from that one a little bit later. And so he is labeling this new movement. What is postmodernism? Well, it's based on the perception of the existence of a modern era, okay, that dates from the Enlightenment, okay, fine, and has now run its course. Okay. So whatever was going on, it's at the end. We're at the end of the course. This modern era was predicated on progress, great, fine, but all of us can see that the development continues without leading to any of the dreams of emancipation. The Enlightenment was supposed to liberate us, free us, emancipate us. But if we are honest and we look at the world that the Enlightenment has created, we can see that none of those dreams happened. It has been a failure. All right, Richard Rorty, perhaps the most famous of the American, whoops, postmodernists. The postmodern task to figure out what to do now that both the age of faith and the enlightenment seem beyond recovery. So what do we mean by the latter part? Well, that one's a little more obvious. The enlightenment, yes. It had all of these claims about <coughs> politics and science and engineering and so forth. All that, from our perspective, is beyond recovery. It can't, can't be saved anymore, but this is an even broader claim. It's not only the Enlightenment, but the earlier age of faith that we were to trust religious institutions and religious trust. They're both failures. So the pre-modern world, beyond recovery. The modern world is beyond recovery, so we need something post. That is the claim here. Now, I want to then start <clears throat> Philosophically formalizing this is to help set up our structure for the rest of the day. When we do philosophy, of course, we ask fundamental questions, the big questions about the nature of the world, right? 
What really is real? How do we sort out the difference between things that are mere figments of our imagination from things that actually exist? And the big question there, does, do the gods exist or not, or a god and so forth, or are we in a natural world and the natural world is reality? How do I tell the difference between dreams and actual facts? And how do I know when I have a true opinion instead of something that's maybe just some sort of wishful thinking? That leads directly into the knowledge claim, how do I really know? Any big question, right? What methods or processes do I go through? We all have lots of beliefs and opinions. We know there's lots of falsehoods out there and so forth. How do we sort those out systematically? What is it to be a human being? Who am I? What are my core capacities, my, 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 my core expectations for myself and for other people? Am I in charge of my life or am I pushed around by forces beyond my control? I probably know what happens to my body as I get older and die, but do I have a soul that separates and goes on, yes or no? How should I live my life? Right. What are the top values that are worth pursuing? Health, wealth, love, sex, freedom, challenge, adventure. What kind of person do I need to become or be in order to best have a chance of succeeding at life? What character traits or virtues should I acquire? And then how should we, since we are social beings as well as individual beings, how should we organize ourselves and what principles should be in place to govern and inform our social interaction? So we have questions of metaphysics, epistemology, human nature, ethics, and politics. That then is to say any comprehensive philosophy, and the philosophy, and there's lots of sub-questions, philosophers will address all of those questions, come up with answers, put them together into a package, and that's your philosophy of life. So the claim about modernity is that the philosophers of modernity are in general abstract agreement on a certain set of claims. Reality is the natural world. We know the natural world by using our senses to observe it, to categorize things, to do experiments, to reason about the interpretations, essentially scientific method. Human beings are born with a set of capacities that are not yet set one way or the other, and it's as a result of experience and decisions that we make that we form our character that primarily we are in charge of our own identities and the formation of our identities. We decide what we're going to believe, uh, ultimately what our passions are going to be, what habits of action we engage in. We are not subject to forces that make us do what we want. People should pursue happiness. It's important to dream your own dreams, formulate your goals, take charge of your life, economically, politically, religiously, artistically, and so forth, so that individualism. And then very broadly, we find moderns uh, advocating some sort of liberal democracy, republican, parliamentarian systems, and so forth as the right way of organizing. This is the philosophy that dominated historically in the Enlightenment and has carried on significantly into the modern world. Now, the philosophical contrast then to pre-modernism is, again, at a high level of ab abstraction. The pre-moderns had wanted to say, we want to know what reality is. Yes, there is a natural world, but it is a lower world or a subordinate world, and you can't understand the way the world is except by reference to a higher world that brought it into existence, gave it form. And so supernaturalism is the dominant framework that ultimately knowledge comes from God or the gods revealed to special individuals who are it, mystics. The rest of us who don't necessarily have those mystical insights have to accept on faith those authoritative ones. Dominant, particularly in the Western tradition, is the notion that we're not born neutral, but rather that we are born in sin, that we start, so to speak, with the moral cards stacked against us, and we need to get out of our initially negative sit situation, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Evil. We're not autonomous. We are subjects. We are subjects to God's will, and we should be obedient, first and foremost and uh, dualism, the idea that the human being is a body and a soul. Those are two different types of stuff that happen to be together for a while, but they will ultimately separate upon death. That everybody is, particularly as we see in feudal institutions, bound by networks of service and obligation and doing their duty. 
So if you're a peasant, you serve your feudal lord. Your feudal lord is supposed to serve the king. The king is supposed to serve God. And actually, everyone is supposed to serve God. Wives are to serve their husbands. And so everything in terms of morality and politics is cashed out in terms of networks of duty and obligation. Right? So we have then a systematic opposition between a pre-modern way of thinking and a modern way of thinking. So when someone like Richard Rorty says the age of faith is beyond recovery, what he means is that this entire philosophical system was tried and found wanting, both intellectually and existentially. Then we got into the modern world for a couple of centuries. We experimented with that intellectually and institutionally. It also has been found wanting. They're both out. We need a third column with something dramatically different. Now here's Foucault again, <clears throat> one of his uh, uh, very thoughtful summaries, or uh, interpreters summarizing that the moderns made reason fundamental and said it's by reason that we can figure out the truth and acquire genuine knowledge. What Foucault and his followers are saying here is a strong claim. It's not just that they had false theories about what knowledge is, but the whole idea that there is such a thing as knowledge is meaningless. That we argued, moderns and pre-moderns, about the nature of truth. Is truth God-given or is truth discovered by scientists in the natural world? So what really is the truth? That debate is pointless. Truth is a meaningless word. Knowledge doesn't make sense. Truth doesn't make sense. Reason and being for or against reason also is nonsensical. That's a very strong claim. And of course, what that means then is if these are meaningless concepts, then we should just stop using them because we want the words that we use to communicate something but if these have been shown to be meaningless phrases, we should just abandon them. So one of the very first things you will notice when you start reading postmodern literature is they will use the words reason, truth, and knowledge, but they start to put them in quotation marks. And as we know, when we start to use quotation marks, that's a way of distancing ourselves. Right? This person says this is the truth, right? right? Or he claims to know this, right? And the tone of voice right, also carries right, the whole point. And that's then on the say, well, OK, I'm distancing myself, but evangelically, we need to develop a new vocabulary that just doesn't use those words. So this is a very skeptical position. And what's interesting is that pre-moderns had said, no, we can, in fact, know the truth. We can come to know God's will and the nature of God's plan for the world. That's an optimistic claim. The moderns come along and say, no, we can know reality if we do our science very diligently. We can come up with knowledge and truth and so forth. And what we have is a very skeptical moment that says, no. Whatever the philosophers have done, Knowledge is not possible. Truth is a meaningless concept. We move on. So Richard Rorty again. <clears throat> we immediately have a, a problem. And we'll play around with this one a little bit later in the day. Uh, is Foucault making a knowledge claim that he, he knows that there's no knowledge? That it's true that there's no truth? That the, the reasonable position as a philosopher, having thought about these issues, is that reason is nonsensical? All right, so there's something paradoxical in those kinds of formulations. So Rorty is a smart guy. And he says, there's a difficulty here. The difficulty faced by a philosopher who, like myself, is sympathetic to this suggestion, the Foucault suggestion, that those concepts are all meaningless. One who thinks of himself as auxiliary to the poet rather than to the physicist, and we'll come back to that in a moment, is to avoid hinting that this suggestion gets something right. right. So I can't be saying that my philosophy, this postmodern philosophy, is right. Because then I'm going back to that old claim that we just said doesn't make any sense. And I can't be claiming that my sort of philosophy corresponds to the way things really are. Right? So any sort of Philosophers have things going on in their heads, and we're interested in is what's going on in my head, does it connect, correspond to, relate to what's really out there in the world? I can't do that anymore if I'm going to be consistent to my 
claims that reason, truth, and knowledge are concepts. All right, so question for you. I want you to think about this for a minute. What does Rorty mean by saying <clears throat> in this middle phrase here? To think of yourself as working with the poets. You're a thoughtful, intellectual, philosophical person. What does it mean to say, I am working with poets rather than physicists? Think about that, write down a few thoughts. This is the big distinction between objectivism, small o, and subjectivism. Where do we take the source of our philosophy to be coming from? Physicists, what are physicists all about? They're saying out there in the world, there's the physical world, and it is what it is. And there are objective principles that are governing it, and what we need to do as thoughtful people, particularly as scientists, is take our bearings from the objective world. What you want to be true, what you think is true, what you feel is true is ultimately secondary or irrelevant. You have to get it right, because that's the way, objectively, the facts are. Now, if we reject all of that, you know, say the job of philosophers is not to help physicists do their jobs better at describing the way the world is. Instead, as a philosopher, you're with the poets. Well, what do poets do? You, know, you read a poem, do you find yourself saying, sorry, that's just factually wrong, right? That's a misinterpretation, right? Where's the data? Right? No. That's not the right question to ask. Right? The question is, how does this make you feel? Yeah. And we start to say things like, well, poets are expressing their inner feelings. They're trying to externalize something that's inside them. Or they have inchoate thoughts kicking around, and those thoughts might be fantastical, came to them in a dream. But it doesn't matter really whether they're, whatever they're writing about actually is referencing something out there in the world. It can be entirely fictional, and we're okay with that. And the point is, does it adequately express what's going on inside me, inside the subjective? So rather than outside in, it's inside out. You're externalizing the subject. What does this then mean in practice, if we're going to be more like the prose. Well, here we have a literary postmodernist, Stanley Fish, professor of English literature for many years at Duke University, then moving to my home state of Illinois, arguing deconstruction, which is a literary application of postmodern epistemology. If we're not interested in truth, rightness, facts, what does the poet really mean? What, what does the author really mean? If that's now the wrong question. And we're going to, of course, interpret text, because that's what literary critics do. Well, deconstruction relieves me of the obligation to be right. I don't have to worry about interpreting Shakespeare or Chaucer or Milton the right way. But what's interesting? Well, that's a very subjective criterion, right? Yeah. Well, I don't know. What's interesting to you? Not necessarily what's interesting to me. But we're kind of looking for maybe a mutual interestingness. And so, yes, we set aside objectivity entirely as a criterion, and we go for some sort of subjective criterion. You pour your interpretations into the text, whatever associations it suggests to you, that's fine. And it's going to then be a different criterion for success in the literary critic world. That then is to say there's a strain of postmodernism that then just kind of goes into aesthetic play and free association and whatever turns you on and so forth as a direction. But there's a darker implication that comes out of this. And one of the things that the postmoderns want to argue is, of course, all of those people who are resisting this move, to saying there is no truth, there is no knowledge, everybody just has their own subjective interpretations. They're still insisting, no, I have the truth. There is a right answer, and it's important that you believe this right answer. There is then an immediate implication that there is something wrong with those people, that they're trying to impose their subjective framework on your subjective framework to try to make it override your subjective framework. So we're familiar with political imperialism, right? One system saying we have the right system, and we go across the seas, and we impose our system politically on someone else. 
in the intellectual realm, the idea of arguing for the truth of your system and that other people need to believe that becomes an intellectual imperialism. All knowledge rests on injustice. There is no right. Nobody has the right answer, not even in the act of knowing to truth. There's no right to truth or a foundation or truth. And the instinct for knowledge is malicious. All right. Because you are taking away other people's knowledge, right? That reinterpreted. So this whole modern idea, right, that what we need to do is cooperatively discuss and debate ideas, put our interpretations out there, criticize each other, take the heat, give heat, be willing to change our minds and so forth, that modern ideal of liberal debate, liberal education, the postmodern then says no. <clears throat> You're making a knowledge claim, that's inappropriate, I squelch it. This is a professor right, arguing for then a different ethos in the classroom. Right? So you don't present both sides, assess their arguments objectively, leave it up to the student as an individual to make up his or her mind. You just have your interpretation, your agenda, and put it out there. Andrea Dworkin, <clears throat> uh, one of the famous uh, arguments for censorship of pornography on uh, postmodern grounds, arguing that pornography is a kind of discourse, that it constructs human beings to think, uh, uh, argued that uh, uh, pornography ought to be censored on the grounds that it doesn't uh, let women develop their own subjectivity. Instead, they are maliciously constructed according to a male subjective interpretation. But she's arguing that this is a, but she's arguing that this is a, symptom of a deeper problem. The modern world said that it was all about liberty for all, including liberty for women, equal rights, and so forth. All of that is a fraud. This is what is really going on. It's malicious. All knowledge claims, all romance claims, all interaction claims, deep conflict between human beings. We're not rational rights respecting beings. One more from Jacques Derrida. He's the one uh, most famous for developing deconstruction theory, but also a philosophy PhD, a very sharp man and a kind of a performance artist. But deconstruction, <clears throat> where is it coming from? This is a striking claim that all of this, deconstruction never had any meaning or interest, at least in my eyes, and as a radicalization, that is to say, within the tradition of a certain Marxism, right, in a certain spirit of Marxism. And what we do know, of course, is that Marxism has been the biggest antagonist and competitor in the modern world to any sort of liberal democratic capitalism market economy as the appropriate force. So we have another kind of opposition at stake here. So what I've done is just marched through some indicative quotations from some leading postmodernists, talking about knowledge, skepticism, human relations, a little bit of politics. How do we put all of this together? Uh, okay, one more quotation from Franklin Trickia, another major postmodern literary theory. Uh, postmoderns seeks not to find the foundation and conditions of truth. Okay, that's now the postmodern thing. We're not about truth. There is no such thing, truth. We're not even looking for the foundations of truth. But if there is no truth, there is no knowledge, there is no rightness, what's left? All there is left is power. Some people have power, some people have more power, some people have less power. And what we then want to do, and this is saying what professors should be doing is in the classroom, exercising power for the purpose of social change. My job as a professor is to turn you into agents of social change if you are my students. And that's code for political activism. One's task as a professor is to help your students right, spot, confront, and work against the political horrors of one's time. So the idea that the Enlightenment has run its course, it's a ruin, it's a dim ruin. We live in a horrible society all around. 
My job is to make students first and foremost aware of how bad things are, the terribleness of the system that they are in. They will get angry. They will want to do something. I'm priming them to go out and become activists. That's my job. All right, now here's the summary. Postmodernism, right? metaphysically, the technical term is anti-realism. And what we mean by that is to say, the concept of realism is a meaningless concept. Right? What is really real? What's truth? Well, truth is meaningless. Can we know reality? That's meaningless. Right? Is there knowledge? No. So, is there really a God or not really a God? Know things. We have beliefs. We do think that we know things. We have beliefs and opinions and ideas kicking around. Where do those come from? Well, the pre moderns wanted to say ultimately those ideas come from God. And they are visited to us either directly or indirectly. So knowledge is ultimately based on the divine. The moderns wanted to say no, knowledge is something that's experiential. You see it, smell it, touch it, taste it, or it's interpretive. You build up an abstract framework to interpret that empirical evidence, and if you do the logic and the math right, then you've got knowledge based on experience and reason. The view here is that also is not true. It's not the individual who figures out the way the world works for himself or herself. Rather, we're all born into social groupings, and partly because of the language we learn, partly because of social conditioning, what we think we know or what we come to believe as facts is put into us by those social conditionings. Now, of course, there are different groups, and different groups condition their members, particularly the young members, differently. So what we should expect then is there's going to be a significant amount of conflict. Different groups will have different understandings of the way the world works, what's important, what the values are, how humans should interact with each other, and the latter two, a little bit in the form of promissory notes, but rather than the individualism, we'll have a group analysis, we'll see it's colliding groups, and some sort of socialism, again, a bit of a promissory note, but the quotation from Derrida on the spirit of Marxism and a reworking of some sort of leftist agenda is going to be part of the package as well. All right, I need to point this way. I'm afraid to click it again because then I think it might be th remembering the previous clicks and then just do them all as a batch. Oh, there we go. Now for the rest of the day, this is all by way of setting up an agenda for us. I want to take all of these things so far and reduce it to four important sub-questions. One question being a question of human nature. The Enlightenment makes the claim that individuals are the real unit. So individualism is going to play out in terms of individual rights, individual self-responsibility, and so forth but that the individual is the unit of reality and that those individuals have agency, right? control, volition, some ability to determine who they are and what their actions are going to be. And so a certain moral and political system is coming up. By contrast, the postmodern claim is that that's not true, that human beings are a construct, right? that who you are as an individual is a vehicle for broader social forces beyond your control. Now, that comes out in the form of modern identity politics, where when we're reading the, the, the journalism, when it says the most important thing when I encounter someone is not who is this person as an individual, but what gender is this person? And I want to categorize that person as in that in a bright group. What race is this person? Right? What's their ethnic background? And so white heterosexual male or black um, <clears throat> uh, lesbian whatever, right? and so forth. Those become the operative ways to understand a human being, that you are formed by primarily your group memberships. Second issue, an epistemological dimension or cognitive measure. The moderns and the Enlightenment say Objectivity is possible. In some cases, objectivity is easy. Sometimes objectivity is more difficult, depending on the question, but it is possible. And it's something that we should strive for, and that we are developing tools of reason and more sophisticated scientific methods to achieve objectivity. And that's what we should be doing. 
versus the very skeptical claim that all of the important success concepts in cognition are failures, right? and we should really just abandon success concepts that have anything to do with a claim to objectivity. So I want to spend one of our sessions looking at the pro and con skeptical arguments. The third issue, <clears throat> normative issues. Is there such a thing as value and values that are universal, that all human beings can or should share, and that if we are rational and committed to those values, despite the fact that we will often disagree about things, we can either, through debate and civil discussion, work out the right answer, or when necessary, agree to disagree until we have another chance, more data comes in, and so forth. So, can we project and create a society in which individuals meet that condition? The Enlightenment says, yes, we can. And we should strive for that. Versus do we want to say, bottom line is, that's a pipe dream that is impossible given the human condition. Conflict is inescapable. Someone's going to win, someone's going to uh, lose. There are power asymmetries, and all we can do is understand the world in terms of shifting power dynamics, some people beating up on others, and that's just life. And then finally, putting all of the others together but adding a few things, how should we assess the world that we are living in? Obviously, a mixture of good things and bad things. Does the good outweigh the bad? Are we making progress? Do we expect that progress is going to continue? How do we even uh, make big judgment calls about that? And of course, we want to do some crystal ball gazing, try to make projections about the future. Are we on an uphill sl slope or a downhill slide? Or should we, on balance, say the concept of progress? Of course, it's another positive success claim. And in fact, there is no such thing. There are nice stories that we tell each other, that uh, people with agendas make up statistics and so forth, but really what's going on is some people have power and they want the rest of us to go along with their agenda and so they will tell us the stories that they want us to believe, but we should be skeptical about those stories and realize that underneath it all, it's a pretty nasty mess. So, <clears throat> how are we doing on time, Sam? for the first session. All right, good. So we'll go to uh, Q&A just on this uh, first set of issues here. But for the rest of the day, we're going to uh, follow John Stuart Mill and his ringing lines from On Liberty. Say, <clears throat> and of course he's a modernist and a liberal, <laughs> so there's already an agenda here. To say, if we want to understand where we are right now, Postmodernism is a real cultural force, intellectually as well. We need to understand it. I want to give their arguments, their positions, their fair share. But we want to stack them up against the other arguments made by the modernists and the Enlightenment advocates as well. So we're going to, as I've done so far, look at more quotations by the postmodernists. So they're speaking in their own words, understand them, put them up against the arguments on the other side. And then you're in a position to make up your own mind. Okay, so Q and A. Thoughts on your mind right now? Uh, 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 you mean fantastic <laughs> presentation so far, uh, Thank Professor you. Hicks? Uh, poets versus physicists. So the the Richard Rorty you reported was saying we, you know, postmodernism is more about poetry than physics. I want to know where is this poetry that they're talking about? Like they're, they're encouraging us to move away from what they're calling physics and go to poetry, but I have never seen any good postmodern poetry. So I'm, I think it's a scam to put a rift to create a dichotomy between our inner world and the outer world, to, to, cr to create a rift uh, um, and, and destroy the, the means for us seeing the outer world and seeing its poetry. Oh, I'll stop there. Good. I'm getting, I'm getting upset. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good question. Uh, actually, a good comment. Right. But yes, uh, let me just say a couple of things in response to that. So we, I think we do need to generalize on poetry. 
So poetry, music, uh, fiction, painting, sculpture. And where is it? Then I think what you have is the history of 20th century modernist and postmodern art. And so if you go to a modernist art museum, a postmodernist art museum, that's where you see it. And of course, if you find the poetry journals, well, fair, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. That's right. But you will notice, what you will notice, uh, uh, not, to, not to advocate here, but there is a big difference, and the break is happening between, say, of someone like, say, an Impressionist or even an Expressionist like uh, Van Gogh, where what's on the canvas is something that is recognizable. The person has looked at the world and is interpreting and adding something personal to it, but you end up with a representational something. And the dramatic break with that comes and then the early modernist, and modernism is used differently in art history, is to say that no, it is a total break with an external reality. It's totally some sort of subjective projection onto the page or onto the canvas. And the fact that you can't understand or recognize what's going on, that's the point. Right? Yeah, just uh, one thing I'm struggling with is, so the proponents of postmodernism and the, I suppose the lecturers that push it. Hello, is that better? Better. Okay. Sorry, the um, proponents of postmodernism and the lecturers that sort of push it to students. I don't get quite get the paradox where it's almost non-conformist, yet the students have been taught to be extremely conformist. Yeah. So I, that's why I, I can't get my head around is that are they just not challenging the professors and what the professors are pushing? Because I, I, I imagine everyone here has experienced what happens when you try and question the, uh, the post-modernist orthodoxy. Yes. Uh, it's, yeah. So there is a kind of paradox there. So it sounds like, uh, and one strain of postmodernism does come out of this kind of a bohemian, romantic, rebel type of tradition. So one interpretation that feeds into postmodernism is that somehow, if you say there are such things as universal truths and objective values, then that means that everybody has to believe the same things and act the same way, and it's going to turn us all into conformist robots. So it's appealing then to say, uh, particularly when you are young, right, to, uh, to the powers that be, right, I'm gonna go off and do my own thing. And so it sounds like it should be appealing to nonconformists, and so we should expect an explosion of diversity and so forth. But then sociologically, it's striking that when you look at the postmodern activists, uh, they do all look the same, and they do all behave the same. Uh, down to the point of, uh, now we're going to get to Antifa hopefully later, but the street activists where they're all wearing the same uniform and there's no individuality even to the point of wearing a mask. You don't want, you just want to be part of a group, part of a, part of a crowd. To connect up with your question about art, it is interesting that in the 19th century, right, artists took pride in being flamboyantly different, right, and unique, but as modernism in the art history sense took over and shaded on into postmodernism. You go into art schools and you can, around campuses, you can recognize all of the art students because they're all wearing exactly the same thing. Right? They're all wearing black jeans and black boots and a black turtleneck sweater. And sometimes their individual variations might be on the tattoos, but they all have tattoos. Right? So how you get from this apparently anti-establishment, stick it to the man, to what seems to be a, a lot of conformity around a certain set of views and even a style, that is interesting. Now, I'll just put one idea out for now. Um, this is supposed to be Q&A. Actually, should I put this aside? No. Well, I do think that, uh, so yeah, I'll just take 20 seconds and float this hypothesis. We can, I can debate this more as the day goes on. But if, uh, as a matter of fact, if you undercut human beings' capacity for independent thinking, for reason, for trusting their own experience, and you teach that people are constructed by the group, then that disempowers young people, and they don't actually develop the cognitive and emotional skills to function as individuals. So it really does destroy their individual humanity. And that leaves you in a very vulnerable, frightened place, and I think it is then a natural human reaction, uh, if you think you're in a complicated world and you don't have the tools to take it on, to seek some sort of comfort or protection in a group. So if I can join onto some group and get accepted by that group, 
then I will feel safer in the crowd. And then that requires a certain amount of conformity to be accepted by the group, something like that. Okay. Yes, it's uh, Scott. Um, the, is this working? Yeah. All right. Um, I, I can see what you're saying applies to the social sciences, but with coronavirus around at the moment, um, I think that whatever we think of as truth, everybody will accept Stanley Fish will go to the doctor. Um, so they will all. So how does it work outside of the political realm? Uh, or do they even try to make it work outside of the political realm? Yes. Good question. Um, again, something we're going to explore over the course of the day. But it, uh, my interpretation is going to be that it does start with politics. And there is an important political part of the story I've de-emphasized so far. We've been emphasizing the cognitive parts. But then it's natural then to say, if you take postmodernism seriously, how far are you going to go? It's one thing to start talking about the arts and tell us, OK, so they're a little crazy and subjectivistic. That's fine. And maybe you know, literature, there's lots of room for interpretation. And history is difficult. It's hard to be objective in history and so on. So uh, as you then march your way through the humanities, we get into the Social sciences. Well, what about anthropology and political science and what the data show and so forth? And you say, all right, it's going to be harder there. And then what about the law? And then as we get into engineering and medical sciences where the rubber really meets the road, do we really think bridges can be constructed right, a, a certain way? And yeah, uh, you know, are there postmodernists in the midst of a coronavirus epidemic, yes or no? How far are they willing to go? Um, so I just want to leave that as an open question. But the, the bottom line answer is that they will, at least in theory, go all of the way. And criticizing medicine, engineering, foundations of science, yes, absolutely. Stephen, I'm just wondering, have you seen the, um, the six hours of dialogue between Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris on what I think is hits on some of the questions that you've raised today. It sound, and I must admit, after six hours, I still can't quite grasp the essence of uh, Jordan's uh, argument. And Sam Harris is also extremely frustrated with, with Jordan in terms of his um, fluidity around some of these, these questions. But as far as I can understand, Jordan um, wouldn't call him sort of post-modernist like in his argument, but it's got some similarity in that he's arguing that there are sort of multiple multiple truths um, that value or objectivity sits in with you know within this crucible of values and metaphysical or mysticism or yeah. or God. Um, I'm just wondering if you've got any comment on that. I've not seen those videos, so I'm, I'm familiar with the works of both of these men. They're both very well informed, very smart. Uh, Sam Harris is a, uh, a modernist. He's a, he's a man of the Enlightenment. He is uh, much more uh, reductionistic uh, than I think is appropriate, but he's nonetheless in the strong uh, uh, modernist tradition. Uh, Jordan Peterson is a, a man with a foot in both worlds, and part of him is he is a man of science, and he knows science very well, and he's been very proficient in the biological basis of psychology and, and trying to develop psychology as an applied science as well. But at the same time, he is the inheritor of one of the big debates in the modern world, one of the ones that we will get to that says uh, there isn't a relationship between the fact orientation in our thinking and the value orientation in our thinking, that he does not see how it is possible to find value the difference between good or bad in any sort of physicalistic or modern scientific framework. And that points him back in the direction then of saying, since values and meaning and the pursuit of those things is absolutely important to our human identity, the modern world can't deliver on those, so we need to go back to the ancients, in fact, to the pre-moderns to find those things. And then if you do that, though, the trade-off is that you can't uh, uh, find a rational grounding for those, and so you start to talk. And this is where Jordan Peterson does start to frustrate people because his language gets much more approximate and metaphorical and then ultimately unsatisfying. So he uh, is an interesting character because he recognizes that the postmoderns are mounting a deep and fully frontal assault on all of the aspects of Western civilization. 
And so Jordan Peterson is wanting to say the Western civilization is in part, this is his interpretation, built up by uh, the ancient Judeo-Christian insights. That's a hugely important part of who we are, combined with modern rational scientific insights. Uh, the ongoing project then is not to be either a pre-modernist or a post-modernist, but to try to find some sort of, sort of synthesis. But to his credit, he wants to say, I don't know how to do this yet. That's the project. Hello, Kate Oski here, right at the front. Ah, oh, sorry, <laughs> okay. All good. I, thought, yeah. um, I was just wondering um, what your thoughts were about the links between postmodernism and globalization and where globalization would sit perhaps between, yeah, modernism or postmodernism. Yeah. I think the, uh, the, the stronger connection is from modernism to globalization. So if you think about the beginnings of the modern world, if you read history textbooks, it'll take us back to Columbus, Protestant Reformation, the tail end of the, the Renaissance in the 1400s in, in Northern Italy especially, where the, uh, the artistic revolutions were then spreading all over Europe and thenceforth, the development of trade networks and so forth. So globalization, the coming together of the world economically, uh, uh, politically, uh, in terms of business, uh, in terms of the religions being aware and people from all over the world experimenting with different religions. That's the, that's the trend of modernism. So to the fact that by the time we get to the 20th century, we're all uh, aware of multiple cuisines and, cuisines and have access to it, all of the, the, the artistic and, mo and entertaining entertainment media, we all have access to that. You know, kids in, uh, in, in, uh, in Hungary and, and Korea are wearing blue jeans from America. Everybody watches the Australian movies when they come out and so forth. So globalization is very much part and parcel of, of modernism. Now that makes sense at a high level of abstraction because it wants to say that human beings are, despite all of our differences as individuals, fundamentally the same. And so we're all going to be pursuing the same values and having the same conversations and having the same debates. Uh, and that ultimately we should all have the same human rights. And so the push for liberal democracy and the respect for rights around the world, that's all part and parcel of the modern process. I think what uh, postmodernism represents though is going to be going back in the other direction. Because what it wants to argue is that there is no such thing as universal human nature. There is no such thing ultimately as an individual. Instead what we have is different groups and those different groups are in conflict with each other. So it's a, to use a slightly old fashioned phrase, it's, it's a balkanization, right? Where uh, for a while in the modern world we said, look all of these, uh, ethnic groups in the Balkans, despite their ethnic and religious and political differences and family clan differences, they should ultimately be able to work out their differences and achieve uh, a peaceful resolution. The postmodern position then would be to say, no, the, the Balkans are always, uh, groups are going to hate each other and we're going to revert back to, to conflict. So I think anti-globalization is going to be part and parcel of the the, uh, the postmodern project. Now one skirmish I think you can see here is that the most globalizing economic force in the modern world has been capitalism. Uh, you know, Hollywood movies and all of the songs and McDonald's and <laughs> Subway and Starbucks and so forth. In some sense they are, they are everywhere but it is part and parcel of the far left to be antagonistic to all of those manifestations of global capitalism. They want to keep out all of the foreign products or all of the ones that are not local in favor of a much more group localized, right, some sort of economic system. So short answer to a big question. Hello, first of all, thank you for coming to Australia. I'm my very great pleased pleasure. to be here. Thank you. And, um, my question is, if knowledge rests on injustice and our knowledge in science is based on nature, does that mean that the postmodernists reject nature? Or do you have to have a stance that um, you don't believe that nature is just? Yeah. <laughs> Deep question, yeah. And since they do, yes, reject nature. Uh, there is, nature is out there. 
and uh, part and parcel of their skepticism is going to be that we really don't have any idea what nature is. So that then just must mean if I think I know what nature is, then I'm deluding myself. But if I also want you to accept my understanding of the way nature is, then I'm not allowing you to have your own subjective beliefs. And so hence the maliciousness, I'm trying to impose my agenda on you. Now, we'll be drilling down into those issues a whole lot more, but if you take, for example, um, you know, just one example, uh, we have educational results, and one of the distressing things is that we look at educational results across different ethnic groups and racial groups, and there are huge gaps. Right? So this group does very well, this group does so-so, and then there's a couple of groups that persistently don't do very well. So. What do we do? Well, one answer then, this is going to be the modernist answer, is to say, well, all individuals have the capacity to learn this stuff because they're human beings and all human beings have, have intellectual capacities. And so what we need to do is to develop better delivery mechanisms and motivate them so that they can learn their, their stuff. And maybe we need to have extra effort devoted toward those who are underachieving to get them up to the same standard because everybody can achieve at a very high level. So we're very progressive in that optimistic sense. Oh, I'm sure we're all familiar with the reaction that says, um, that just shows that the tests that we are using to assess where students are, are biased. And that just means that there is one set of beliefs about what counts as knowledge proficiency that has come from one group. And it's typically the most successful group in society and that what they then want to do is to say everybody has to believe the things and acquire knowledge and skills that we think, according to our group, are important. And they will say that that's inappropriate because the reason why these people in the other groups are underperforming is that's just not how they think. That's not their values. They are different. They have a different understanding about what knowledge is, what beliefs are, what values are. And so to put it crudely, they don't all want to be a bunch of white males. They're different. So they have a different value framework. And what we need to do is respect their different framework. If that means math is not important in their framework, then we shouldn't be pushing math down their throats. If we think chemistry and so forth is important, well, we're just being imperialists by forcing them to learn chemistry. And so what we then need, and this is, multiculturalism is a, a word that means different things to different people. Uh, part of then of respecting multiculturalism is to say that there are multiple epistemologies and you can't be imperialistic with respect to your particular epistemology. You know, one of the arguments then will be then to say, well, if you look at science and we say science is great and look at all the accomplishments and so forth, then you look at the history of science, well, it started with Europeans, the vast majority of it has been developed by white males, and so the response is going to be, well, that's just a white male. It's not you, folks. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I've been wanting to ask you this question um, for a short time, so or for a long time, sorry. I hope I can make it into a coherent question. But it seems to me, sorry, it seems to me that um, from the little I've studied of postmodernism and having been a former scientist, that it's, it's kind of a, a form of a, a perverse, destructive form of skepticism, whereby skepticism is supposed to, you know, your realization that you may not know everything there is to know and to, you know, not to turn sci science into a face. And it almost seems to have evolved into some kind of narcissistic version of solipsism. And maybe I'm misquoting, I'm not a ph philosopher, but like where my constraints reality is the only reality there is. Mm. None of these postmodernists, from the little I've read, seem, they seem to make grand assertions about how there is no truth, there, you know, knowledge is, is uh, not evil, but whatever, is, is it worth, uh, worthless. But none of them go to, I, none of the arguments I've ever heard seems to like, quote, justify why the age of enlightenment or reason is dead. But why? Because we didn't end up in some kind of utopia? Mm -hmm. So boiling it down, what do you think of my, my thought that this is a perversion of skepticism, not really true skepticism, and it leads to a, a weird form of solipsism? And yeah. 
my other comments. Okay, very good. Another issue that we'll be drilling down when we look at the knowledge issues, but absolutely right. The modernists claim that uh, objectivity is possible and that in some circumstances even certainty is possible is a very strong claim. And one of the things that is to the credit of the modernists is to say that we have to be very careful about when we are in a position to make that claim. That it's under, particularly on complicated matters, only after great exertions, including peer review and multiple vettings by other experts in the field, can we be strongly optimistic that we are on to something. And so skepticism, I think, in the practicing scientist form that you are talking about uh, amounts to uh, not being credulous and being vigilant in self-monitoring. Have I paid attention to all of the data? Have I gone out of my way to find criticisms of my position as much as possible? Have I subjected my hypothesis to criticism? from other smart people with different frameworks and so forth. And to the extent that I do that, then I can upgrade my confidence in my belief system. But to the extent that I have not done that, I should be skeptical or at least agnostic or more nuanced in the degree to which I'm making my, my knowledge claim. So a skepticism in that sense is a healthy part of the, the, uh, the project. Uh, that I will be agnostic until I am convinced strongly uh, by evidence on the other side. Now, what you're onto, uh, quite rightly though, is the skepticism that is much more virulent, that will then say all of the things that go into the scientific method, and we'll be talking about all of those, observation, hypothesis formation, experimental design, statistics, logical analyses, and so forth, there are skeptical arguments that can be directed about each of those. All of those are fallible processes. And if you then come to believe strong forms of skepticism about each stage and each element of the scientific project, that will then lead you to a heavy duty skepticism if you don't think that it's possible to answer all of those skeptical objections. And so then you will say, even the scientific project can't meet the grade when it comes to objectivity. And so the appropriate position is a kind of overarching skepticism. Now the historical claim I'm going to make is that by the time we get to the middle part of the 20th century, philosophy was in a very skeptical phase both in its continental manifestations, existentialism was in the ascendancy, but also in the major strands of Anglo-American philosophy. And the first generation of, of, uh, of postmodernists, all of them uh, PhDs in philosophy, all of them doing work on epistemology, uh, very well educated, bought into and accepted what were then state-of-the-art skeptical arguments uh, that had been mounted against all aspects of the Enlightenment project, and they thought that they were true. And so, yes, that heavy-duty skepticism is an outcome of it. Now, the implication of that, then, is if you're a heavy-duty skeptic, do you uh, stay with some sort of solipsism? So you kind of retreat to, well, I guess I'm just stuck in my head with various kinds of beliefs kicking around, and I have no way to validate whether any of them have any connection whatsoever to an external world. That's Richard Rorty saying we have to totally abandon any sort of correspondence understanding. We just become full expressionist poets or whatever. That certainly is one possibility. Most of the postmodernists, though, are going to reject that individualized skepticism that comes out in a social, uh, in a solipsism, they're going to want to socialize things in various directions. Now there are problems there, but the position is going to be that nobody really has knowledge, but that rather than uh, what's going on in our, said, our heads, rather coming from an objective, scientifically informed nature understanding, there are just different social groupings that condition us to believe various things. So it's going to be a kind of a, a social solipsism, if that makes any sense. All right, so one more question for this session, then we'll take our break. Okay, good. Thank you, Stephen. My name's Caroline. Um, I come from a profession that I believe sits slap bang in the middle of subjectivity and objectivity, and a profession I think that has handled that really badly, which is psychology. Uh. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts about what the psychological profession has contributed to postmodernism. Yeah, good. 
<laughs> Again, a question that yeah, anticipates some of the things that we will uh, be drilling down to. Uh, so a couple of things right quickly. Um, it's kind of interesting if you look at the progression of the histories of science. We are having our first big debates in the early modern world over astronomy, heliocentric model of the universe versus the, uh, the, the geocentric model of the universe, and that's in the 1500s. So you have Copernicus with the first modern expression or assertion of a heliocentric model of the universe. And Copernicus, interestingly, didn't publish his hypothesis in his lifetime because he was afraid. <laughs> you start arguing about how the heavens really go while well, you're infringing on the territory of religion and the church, which was uh, in power at that time. And there's a charming anecdote that uh, in his final year he realized he was dying, that he allowed his manuscript to go to press, and that he actually had a copy of this manuscript in his hands before he died. I would like to believe that that was, that was true. It's a, kind of a charming story. So in the 1500s, we're having debates over the way the macro structure of the universe really goes. So early science. That seems to get resolved by the time we get into the 1600s. So astronomy and physics by the, that time are solidly scientific and they're recognized as, as such. Mathematics and the tools are also being developed. 1700s, chemistry comes online, and we get the development of the periodic table and all sorts of uh, very fascinating st studies that are going to play out in industrial revolution, industrial chem. Uh, so 1700s is the century of chemistry coming online. 1800s, biology, uh, evolutionary theory, the great taxonomies from Linnaeus uh, partly as a result of globalization, all of the different animals and plants from all over the world the scientists can study and see all of the kingdoms and genus species relations. So all of those magnificent taxonomies are being developed in the early 1800s. Out of that evolutionary theory in the middle part of the 1800s, genetics with Mendel in the late part of the 1800s. So then we're going so from physics to chemistry to biology and then we start studying human beings, and of course we have this, you know, we're part and parcel of the animal kingdom, but we also have this powerful brain and mind, and so the psychologists start to come online in the early part of the 1900s. Now, I think a century later, we're still having arguments about whether psychology is a science yet, right, or whether it's still in the anteroom to science and working it out. Um, and I'm a little bit on the science side. From I, I think the psychologists are, are in the club now. But uh, of course, there's a lot of crap <laughs> also that goes on for sure. But it makes sense that uh, you know, psychology is perhaps the most complicated of the science. So the, the methodology uh, needs to be worked out, and we're still still working it out. But to keep long story short, if you look at the two paradigms that dominated 20th century psychology, you have Freudianism and behaviorism, and both of them are claiming to be scientific understandings of the human mind. Um, and they're both, I think, failed paradigms. But Freud is arguing explicitly for a strong biological basis to the human mind, that we can't understand the human mind except as being the product of a, you know, many millennia of biological evolution that has bred into human beings the powerful instincts that have enabled predator species to survive and flourish. So we have instincts for aggression and sexuality, and so our id is constituted by that. And then what we will call the conscious mind is kind of this Johnny-come-lately evolutionary faculty that's not very powerful and frail and fallible, so we're not really rational. We are fundamentally irrationally driven animalistic creatures of conflict and so forth. So then that's going to feed into postmodernism in a certain way because that's a strong deflating of the aspirations of the power and competency of reason back in the direction of kind of animalistic conflict. And so what is interesting, and I don't want to make this, I said long story short, didn't I? I'm not doing very well on that. So there is going to be a, 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 a blending there. 
Uh, there's going to be a kind of Marxism, the political agenda that you are starting to signal is interestingly going to be blended, a neo-Marxism blended with a neo-Freudianism, and one of the strains that feeds into postmodernism is exactly that. Now, the other school of 20th century psychology that is dominant is behaviorism. And <clears throat> behaviorism has its roots in Thorndike, Watson, and, and those guys, but reach a, reaches a kind of maturity in B.F. Skinner, who was uh, uh, Indiana University for many years where I did my graduate work. Uh, and in some ways, it's the opposite of Freudianism, because what it wants to argue is that basically human beings are not instinctually based creatures at all. Instead, human beings are born, and they're basically lumps of plasticine, uh, or some sort of enormously plastic. There is no human nature. And that through environmental conditioning, you can take a newborn baby and make whatever you want out of it. It's totally plastic and so totally conditioned by prevailing environmental and or social forces. Now that, as a scientific theory of the human mind, also can fit with an environment, or sorry, a Marxist environmental determinism, and so there is some blending that goes on there. And we'll also be talking about some other very plastic understandings of human nature that say that human beings are shaped totally by social conditioning, that's going to also feed into postmodernism. So yes, psychology has been part and parcel of, of, uh, of this whole agenda. Okay, so I think we'll take a break now. Am I right about that? Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the first session. Please thank Professor Stephen Hicks. Thank you.